Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, budget forum. I'm George Lauber, Worcester County Executive, and I'm joined by Ken Jenkins, our Deputy County Executive, Joan McDonald, who's our Director of Operations, and we'll do a few other introductions in a minute. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag. Please remain standing for a moment of silence for all the men and women deployed around the world. You may be seated. Our meeting tonight uh, is to hear the public uh, with ideas uh, and opinions that they want to express uh, in anticipation of our executive branch developing and submitted to the Board of Legislators our 2019 county budget. For those who may have had past experience with uh, budget uh, discussions, this is the first time that the executive branch has ever held uh, a series of forums in advance of the preparation, final preparation, and the submission of the budget to the legislature. The process from here uh, focuses on Friday, November 9th, when uh, the Board of Legislators will receive the final budget. Uh, those of us in, in the administration will have uh, plenty of additional work to do between now and then to try to put all the documents, uh, all the elements of the document in place and present it to the Board of Legislators. Now when the Board of Legislators has the document, they'll begin a series of meetings of the Budget and Appropriations Committee to deal with each of the different departments of county government and the offices of county government and different issues, revenue and uh, expenditures, uh, both. Uh, the Board of Legislators will establish two mini public hearings which will be held uh, uh, earlier in the process, uh, generally they happen in November, and they will be held in one in the northern part of the county, one in the southern part of the county, and then they have uh, a day in which they make additions to the budget, make final deletions, and then a final public hearing, uh, and then they will uh, adopt a budget, I believe, hopefully, on uh, Monday, December 10th, I think is what they've set aside, Monday, December 10th, that's the target date. The budget has to be in final form. Uh, by the end of the year, technically I think December 27th is the final day by which it has to be in place. We operate on a calendar year, fiscal year, and uh, Westchester County prides itself on not having late budgets, as is not the case, or is not historically the case in Albany. Most recently it has not been the case to a greater extent. But uh, uh, we have, the, as the executive, I have opportunity to veto, uh, line out a veto or veto the whole budget. They have the opportunity to override the veto, so there's a little uh, follow-up that might happen after the 10th. But <coughs> this session is important, and our mission here is to listen to you. Uh, the the three-minute speaking limit we know is a short period of time, and uh, that makes it difficult for the speaker, but it's important that if you have written testimony that you want to submit, if not now, then subsequent to this, by all means, feel free to do it. And we'd like to see whatever you have in writing uh, as soon as you'd like to share it, which will give us some insight. You reserve the right to advocate for any changes that we don't include in the budget to your liking uh, once we submit the budget to the legislature in their public hearing. So we understand you get now a couple of bites at the apple before the, uh, before the process is over with. In terms of the process, we have a floor microphone uh, that you see in this uh, card right here. If anyone is unable to easily come down the stairs, get to the microphone, just let one of our staff people know and they'll be happy to bring the handheld to you so you can speak from where you are sitting. It's helpful if you stand just so everybody can see you and they know you're speaking. When you do speak, uh, we'll announce your name, we have your cards, and we'd like you to sign up. If you have not signed up to speak, but as the session goes along, you'd like to speak, all you need to do is go back, you know, tell the front desk, and they'll put your name on a card, we'll get the card and go in sequence. If you have any particular urgency, child care issues, anything else, uh, going home to watch the World Series is not considered an emergency tonight, particularly because the Mets and Yankees are not in the World Series. But absent that, if you do have some type of time of emergency, let them know, and then we'll try to uh, adjust that as much as possible. Our discussion tonight is about the county budget. There's always lots of other ancillary issues to talk about, which is why uh, I have a series of coffee and conversations on Saturday mornings. I was in White Plains last week with Ben Boykin. This coming week I'll be in Peekskill with John Testa. But if you want to talk about some issue that's not budget related, we're going to ask you to please hold your comment so we can talk just about budget related issues. Now, we haven't submitted the budget, so you're not, you're not commenting off of an existing set of numbers. 
But if somebody wants to talk about the placement of the Nourishell Family Court, that is not strictly a budgetary issue. And there's another time and place for that. And as I think most of you should know by now, we're more than happy to engage you on any topic under the sun. This is about our 10th public forum of some, for, of some sort, in addition to the coffee and conversations, of which there have been 13 of, and uh, we've shared services, we've talked about the airport, so uh, we're certainly not looking to shut anybody down, but we do want to stay focused on the, on the budget. When you get up to speak, we have our uh, timekeeper, is Joe Scamato, uh, who is sitting with Carolyn Fortino, they're both with our communications staff. A round of applause in this fine institution. Joe just found out today he passed the law for us. So now Joe has the force of law. He holds up the yellow folder for caution and the red folder for stop. Now, I've been in more than my share of debates where I pay no attention to those two folders. Don't do what I do. Do what you should do if you would. And we'll let you complete the thought. But if you're in the middle of a long thought, then uh, you know, you're know going to have to bring it to close. It, we're going to begin until 9 o'clock one way or the other. As we saw earlier this afternoon, uh, we had a dead time and then people uh, didn't ask then, but you know, we'll entertain you coming back to finish your thought if that's what you want to do. But since you can put things in writing, you'll get your message across regardless. So I think all of that is uh, part of the equation. In addition to introducing uh, Joe and Carolyn, we have with us a number of our members of our executive team. Uh, we have Andrew Ferris in the back of the room, who's growing out the mustache and goatee. Uh, he's the chief of staff. We have uh, with us Carolyn Chaffee, who's our director of communications in the back. Bridget Gibbons is our director of economic development. Uh, we have our, our commissioner of senior services and programs, May Carpenter, is with us. Uh, our deputy director of operations, Emily Saltzman, is here. I see uh, we have a variety of folks who serve as assistants in various policy areas. And I see that we have uh, Blanca Lopez with us. Uh, we also have Susan Spear with us as well, and I'm sure we've got some people out in the hallway. And as I plan to turn 65 in about three weeks, I don't know if I can see anybody else. Have I missed anybody back there from the team that I need that I should introduce? We got everybody? Very good. If any elected officials uh, uh, are present, uh, they'll be recognized, and they also are entitled to speak if they'd like. So we'd have that uh, as part of the process. Uh, we do have, uh, on behalf of New York State Senator Shelley Mayer, uh, Andy Booter is with us, and uh, Andy is here on Shelley's behalf. We are in Shelley's Senate District, uh, which I used to represent, so uh, we appreciate Andy being here and uh, being able to share with Shelley issues that have come. And we really want to thank Bill Colonna uh, from Pace University for use of this room. It's a beautiful environment. <laughs> and thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask both of my uh, colleagues, uh, Ken Jenkins and uh, Joe McDonald, to share a few thoughts, and then we'll get started. Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins. Thank you, County Executive George Latimer. Certainly this is a, a fantastic opportunity. Thank you all for coming out and missing the first few innings of the World Series to make sure to be here. But more importantly, um, this is a tremendous opportunity. And both um, the County Executive and I spent a lot of time with the legislators. And this is the first time ever that you've got an opportunity to say something before the budget gets submitted and not in a way that is the individual meetings that have happened, but certainly the, the, the opportunity is a public forum as the county executive has been fantastic in doing. Um, this particular session is an outshoot of the transition team the county executive put together and to make sure to hear from all of the folks around the county in one of the four or five public hearings that happened, or the six public hearings that happened with the, the transition team, but to make sure that you had an opportunity to hear your voice the Board of Legislators certainly considered changing the time frames of the, of the public hearings and the budget submissions themselves. But this is a fantastic opportunity to have this happen, keeping in mind that there's significant budget constraints and making sure that we're trying to fit inside of the world that we happen to live in. But we're all working extremely hard and we're looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts this evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Jill McDonald, Director of Operations. Thanks, Ken, and, and thank you, George. Um, I find it very, very uh, helpful as we go through this budget process. The, this is my first year uh, in the county, and it's it's really important to hear the voices not only of our county departments, um, as George mentioned, uh, Commissioner Carpenter is here, but to hear from citizens and organizations that 
supplement what we do uh, in county government and uh, partner with us in county government. So we are very much looking forward, uh, as both George and Ken said, at this stage of the process is where we make our final uh, budget decisions before we present uh, uh, the full budget to the Board of Legislature. So thanks so much. Thank you both. Uh, I do want to just highlight very generally, then we'll get to the speaking. Um, the county budget is a $1.8 billion document. Uh, the revenues, uh, the two largest revenue streams in it are property taxes and sales taxes. They're very close in amount uh, in the current year budget. One, I think, is about $560 million in property tax revenue, and the sales tax revenue is about $535 million. Together, that represents about, round numbers, $1.1 billion in revenue. We also get revenue from other uh, taxes, mortgage recording taxes. We have a targeted hotel occupancy tax and some other levies. We also get uh, state and federal aid that represents revenue into the system. We operate a wide variety of services in Westchester County. We have county employees that are tasked in the Department of Parks and Recreation, over 50 parks, five uh, golf courses, public swimming pools, Playland, County Center, a host of facilities. We have a uh, Department of uh, Public Works that includes transportation, which is both the county airport, which functions almost as a separate enterprise fund, and the Beeline bus system, which we run. Uh, we have the Department of Environmental Facilities that treats sewerage, seven sewer treatment plants, water, wastewater treatment plants around the county. Uh, we have uh, uh, arrangements by which we uh, collect garbage and recyclables from the local governments and transfer stations and then uh, burn them at Charles Point or recycle them at uh, two of our MRFs. So the county government is pretty extensive. We have a county jail, we have a county public safety department, there's a probation department, and so forth. When we discuss what county government does many times, the person that we talk to may not have exposure to any of these things. If they don't ride a beeline bus, if they've never been in the county jail, never been on probation, don't think about where the sewage goes when they leave the bathroom, uh, the services that the county provides could be invisible. They see the police fire sanitation of their local government, they have an understand what the federal government does between the post office and social security and SSI and the national defense. So the county government falls in a bit of a dead zone. And we're not here to run you know, county government 101 and get three credits, and this is all in the final exam. But it is important when we put these budgets together to let people understand that we're trying to do something where we are tasked by the state and the federal government to the tune of about somewhere in the vicinity of 70% uh, of the money that we spend or toward responsibilities that we are tasked with doing, we're mandated to do that. Some things are discretionary. The bus system is discretionary. The Department of Social Services is not discretionary. So our ability to impact uh, these things is within a certain parameter. You don't need to know those parameters, but you do need to know that when you speak and you advocate passionately on your behalf, it's important to know that uh, there are a host of other factors that we have to take into account. But with that, nonetheless, we'll get started on what you have to say, and I'll announce the first speaker and then the next speaker so they can get ready. We have uh, Mel Tanzer as our first speaker, and he will be followed by Luis Cherico. Good afternoon. Um, this is on, right? Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. County Executive, Mr. Deputy County Executive. My name is Mel Tansman. I'm the Executive Director of Westchester Disabled on the Move, which is a non-residential independent living center that provides advocacy and services for people with uh, disabilities. Um, before I get into the budget part, I want to make one comment. It's a beautiful facility. I just want to note that people with mobility impairments can only sit at the top. I think you need to take this into consideration when you have public hearings that people should not be relegated to the back of the, uh, of the, of the room. Okay, given that, to get to the heart of the matter. One of the issues that we've been involved with and continue to be involved with is housing for people with disabilities who aren't very, very low incomes. Because of that, we have seen more and more homeless individuals who are disabled as well. For the last year, Westchester Disabled on the Move has been working with a consortium of community-based organizations in Yonkers, New York, trying to get a partnership between the city of Yonkers and the county to establish a day uh, program for
for people who are homeless. Um, as many of you know, until this summer, uh, people who are homeless and drop in uh, shelters had to go on the streets and roam the streets in the heat of summer and the cold of winter. Um, thankfully, in many cases, this has been remedied um, by the Department of Social Services ordering that the uh, uh, drop-in shelters be open. However, not all of them, unfortunately, have the capacity and space to have people stay there all along. So, um, what, is, what are we asking for? Um, our consortium, which currently consists of six to eight active organizations, uh, some of whom are West Hab, Grayston, our own organization, uh, the Sharing Community, uh, the YWCA, and I'm missing many others, um, about six or seven um, very committed organizations, and about, about six or seven others um, who've expressed interest. What we are looking for, and what we, the consortium, have committed to, is to providing services in a day, uh, in a day program for people who are homeless. Uh, for instance, Westchester Disabled on the Move can do help people get on health care, be it Medicaid, Medicare, uh, or deal with private insurance um, through the um, New York State of Health. Um, we can also help people get disability benefits they need. We have commitments from a number of organizations. If there is a day program, and if there is a location for a day program, to provide those services. So what we are asking for is for the county to consider, uh, I'm not gonna give an amount, but for issuing an RFP to the community to establish the first day program in Westchester County in the city of Yonkers. Um, Mel, Mel, we've just about expired. Okay, so well, thank you. Want to just wrap it up in a second. Okay, um, so that is essentially what we're looking for, and I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention over there. I apologize for that. Uh, so that's what we're asking for. We're, we're asking for the county to commit some dollars for a uh, for putting out a contract. We're asking for a contract for a day program. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Louise Cherico, and she will be followed by Desiree Berger. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. My name is Louise Jericho, and uh, you'll be happy to know I brought a prepared statement, so I won't babble. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm rep tonight I'm representing um, a committee that I sit on as part of Community Voices Heard, which is uh, Homeless Are People Too. And I'm here to speak about um, some of the issues with the shelter system and the drop-in, specifically being ADA. Uh, compliant, which many are not. And um, the ATA is a federal law and it requires that people with disabilities have full equal access to buildings and services and this includes um, family shelters. Um, right now there, there are many shelters violating this and um, there's problems that are arising because of it in 2012 at Oasis, there were there were people that, there was a person that was required to sleep in a chair because they could not reach the upstairs bedrooms, and he was disabled. And um, as a result of that, he developed circulation issues and almost had his leg amputated from being in a chair. Um, let's see, also, um, and I want to bring up too, and I'll submit this because I know the time goes very fast. Currently, the OTDA, as part of the state that oversees homeless service, services, is actually offering $100,000 grants for shelters that want to upgrade to become ADA compliant. And what was the number, Laura? No, how yes. many people have applied for it thus far? They, they, I spoke to them today, they said very, very few. Very few. And they put this out in June. So um, I'm going to hand this over to you, mm -hmm. and, um, and you can take a look at it. And I hope you consider bringing our shelters up to code. Thank you. Okay. Great. Sure. Thank you so much. Next up is Desiree Berger and followed by Armando Castro. First, I want to thank 
George Latimer and his staff for hosting this meeting uh, before the budget is finalized and for all the continued support that has been shown to the survivors, community, and the staff of My Sister's Place. My name is Desiree Berger and I am the Yonkers Family Law Attorney at My Sister's Place. I represent survivors of domestic violence in Yonkers Family Court and Yonkers Integrated Domestic Violence Court. My Sister's Place has been working to end domestic violence and human trafficking in Westchester County since 1976. We provide comprehensive direct services advocacy, and community education. MSP takes a holistic approach to address the root causes of family violence and to create a world in which every individual has the basic right to be free from gender-based violence and to engage in relationships that embrace the principles of respect, equality, and safety. We are actively working to make Westchester a better, safer community where its residents are free from abuse. For example, in mid-July of this year, a client came to the legal center at MSP seeking help with her family offense case against her husband. The two had been married for a few years and this client was living in constant terror. The client was being physically assaulted by her husband on a daily basis who would routinely shove her or hit her in the back of the head. As if the physical and emotional abuse were not enough, this client who was on a fixed income would be forced to hand over her SSI money to her husband every month or risk being thrown out from the marital home. This left the client with very little money for food and other necessary items to survive. She had called the police multiple times and had even gone to the family court for help with little success. It was not until my sister's place became involved in her case that she was able to get the vital help that she needed to ensure her safety and stability as a member of the Westchester community. This client's story is just one of the thousands of people we serve at my sister's place. Whether it's through our Center for Legal Services, our shelter, or our direct advocacy services, MSP is constantly working at making Westchester County a safer community. My sister's place is a member of the Westchester Women's Agenda, and we are advocating for a 5% nonprofit in increase across the board. Again, thank you to the county executive and his staff for hosting this meeting before they finalize the budget and for the support they've already shown the survivors and the community of M at MSB. Thank you. Up next is Armando Castro, which will be followed by Elisa Keste. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening. My name is Armando Castro. I am the coordinator of resident of residential case management at my sister's place. My sister's place is a nonprofit organization in Westchester County that provides counseling, advocacy, shelter, and legal services to victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. I am here to thank the board of legislature, the board of legislature, for continuing to fund our case management contract and to ask that you please continue to support us moving forward. At My Sister's Place, we provide safety, a safety net for the community's most vulnerable families, and the case management contract supports quality management and supervision for direct frontline staff like myself to ensure that we are receiving the best guidance as we navigate working families with, um, who are experiencing crisis. In my role in case management, it is crucial that I have someone I can go to when faced with, dif with difficult decisions. Having our directors regularly, regularly available to check in with us ensures us that the victims and their children's needs are being met in the most effective way and the safest way possible. If we didn't have the opportunity to speak with our directors on a daily basis about specific clients' needs and safety, and opinions, clients' risk of experiencing additional and escalating violence could increase. My sister's place, we are ever mindful of the challenging and intense nature of domestic violence work. Unlike other types of job environments, staff members like myself are vulnerable to the effects of burnout and the distressing impact of clients hearing, hearing clients' traumatic stories on a day-to-day -day basis. The Board of Legislators continued support of the case management contract ensures that therefore, hold on, I have a drill going. Um, ensures that staff members are supported and delivering the best quality of service to clients, therefore promoting self-care and the avoidance of burnout, traumatization amongst our staff. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys tonight and for the continuing support of my sister's place. Thank you. Thank you. Elisa Keston, followed by Lisa Soysher. Good evening and thank you very much. I am Elisa Keston. I'm the Executive Director of Volunteer 2. 
Volunteer New York, and tonight I'm speaking on behalf of the Westchester Women's Agenda. We represent 53 individuals and 26 organizations who serve tens of thousands of Westchester residents each year, providing everything from child care to senior services. For over 20 years, the agenda has been a leading voice for women, delivering essential services that support women and families to keep Westchester thriving. A woman with a child escaping domestic violence, a family that has been evicted from their home, an individual desperately in need of substance abuse counseling, all will likely call on one of our members to help them navigate from trauma to triumph. We recognize that you have tough decisions to make, but we must speak up because one thing is for sure, your budget decision will impact residents across the county who <coughs> depend on our services to remain safe, secure, and healthy. We are here tonight to shed light on the difference between a 5% increase in funding, which is what we are asking for, and from being held harmless for yet another year. Here is just one example of the vital work we do. One of our members runs a legal helpline for individuals who need guidance but cannot afford legal representation. The helpline is staffed by an attorney. This organization allocates $62,000 annually for this position, but as you know, attorneys cost a lot more. This is a clear example of stretching dollars. The helpline receives more than 2,000 calls each year, dealing with all kinds of legal issues. Due to a lack of funding, the organization must consider cutting back helpline hours and extending wait times. Callers to helpline include individuals dealing with domestic violence, sexual assault, and elder abuse. What will happen to them if their calls go unanswered? Our members have already been stretched thin, doing even more with less, far less than what is needed to operate our programs efficiently. Here's the bottom line. Budget cuts and flat funding do not equal fewer people in need. In fact, the demands for our services have grown dramatically. In closing, I will reiterate that keeping our funding flat is not enough. We will not be able to provide the vital services, and without them, Westchester residents, your neighbors, and constituents will suffer. Again, we are asking for a 5% increase in funding for nonprofit organizations, and in addition, we hope that you will consider a multi-year funding plan to create a sustainable funding to support not-for-profit services in the future, and have copies of this. Thank you. Lisa Soitcher. Hi, my name is Lisa Soitcher, and I'm a children's counselor at My Sister's Place. For those of you who may be unfamiliar, My Sister's Place is a nonprofit domestic violence organization that supports domestic violence, uh, survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking throughout Westchester County. MSP is here today as members of the Westchester Women's Agenda and are advocating for a 5% nonprofit increase across the board. This increase will help support the efforts of MSP along with similar nonprofit agencies to better serve the Westchester community. MSP strives to support the impact of the lives of survivors through direct service, but also through the advocacy to change the systematic norms that exist, which often empower the voice of the abuser and disempower the voice of the survivor. As, a child counts, as the children's counselor at my sister's place, I've had the opportunity to support many child survivors between the age of, ages of three and 18, along with their parents. <coughs> I work to provide children with a safe space for them to disclose their struggles and feelings about what they have witnessed or experienced within the home and assist them to identify positive supports and coping strategies to deal with the impacts of domestic violence. I also work to provide parent and child with the education about domestic violence and to promote healthy relationships in order to prevent the cycle of abuse from continuing in the future generations. Currently, I am working with several children clients who are struggling not only with the impacts of domestic violence, but the impacts of losing their home or residency due to domestic violence that has occurred. This is a common issue that survivors face when attempting to lead abusive relationships, leaving, losing everything for a chance at a new beginning. Not only are the children impacted by domestic violence that occurs in the home, but also the instabilities it can cause throughout the surviving parent's life. It is proven that through numerous studies that developing children thrive on stability, predictability, and routines. The life of a child survivor of domestic violence is anything but. This is why it is important for MSP, along with other nonprofit agencies, to advocate for a 5% increase for nonprofits across the board. It is essential we have the funds necessary to be able to increase the supports available to our survivors through direct service but also through the ability to advocate for changes that will make it easier for future generations to become free of the systems that empower the cycle of abuse. It is a chance for Westchester County to take a lead, lead in the charge and make it, 
make a statement that we support our community as a whole and we are working to make it a better and safer place for all that reside here. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak and share the ex my experience and perspective and thank you all for the support that you have already shown our services and survivors and staff and community. Um, have a great rest of your evening and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Case and she will be followed by Sue Abbott. Good evening. My name is Laura Case. I am here tonight as the leader of the Homeless Our People 2 Committee of Community Voices Heard. We are a group of homeless and formerly homeless people pushing for a better shelter system and more truly affordable housing. We are putting together a report on homelessness and have preliminary recommendations to share with you. One of them is that the county needs to budget funding for day programs in cities with large numbers of homeless people, including White Plains and Yonkers. When I was homeless in 2015, drop-in shelters were only open at night. I remember wandering the streets without a place to go. It takes a toll on your health, both mental and physical. Currently, drop-ins are supposed to be open during the day. But even though they're inside, people still don't receive enough of a connection to services. In addition, both drop-ins and residential shelters don't have many recreational activities. At some drop-ins, there's little to do besides reading a book. Day programs would address these needs. These day programs should be open to any adult who identifies as homeless. They must be held in locations which are large enough for homeless people to participate in services comfortably and privately. These programs should be open from morning until evening, and the agencies who run them should be selected by RLP with input from advocates. They should be staffed with housing and benefits counselors, and they should be required to develop relationships with no local not-for-profits. Many agencies already receive grants to provide services like mental health counseling, peer advocacy, legal advice, and more. They just need a place to bring them to the homeless. There is interest in this model. As um, D Director Tansman mentioned, through my workplace, Westchester Disabled on the Move, I am part of a consortium of agencies already committed to doing this in Yonkers. We understand that the county is under financial strain, but doing this is important and it would not be as costly if existing agencies contribute. We do also believe that cities and the state should pitch in. The number of homeless people in our county has increased by more than 25% since 2010. It's hard enough to find a place to live in Westchester right now. It is even harder if you have no one to help you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sue Abbott, and she will be followed by Jerry Curry. I'm the Associate Director of Programs at Arts Westchester. Um, Arts Westchester is very grateful for the funding that we currently receive from the county. Uh, and this year we have respectfully put forth a request uh, for an increase specifically to our Challenge Program, which is a matching grant program that impacts groups all over the county. Um, I'm asking our board member, Jerry Curran, to join me at the microphone to speak a little bit about the program and the impact that Arts Westchester has uh, on all levels around the county. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Mr. County Executive, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy County Exe Executive, and of course, uh, Madam Director. Uh, my name is Jerry Curran, and I live in Newcastle, and as Sue very aptly said, I am on the board of Arts Westchester. And tonight, what I'd like to do is to give a big picture and talk about the impact and the importance of the community-based art programs and the ability of the arts to create and strengthen communities throughout Westchester County. Arts Westchester is committed <coughs> to making the arts accessible to everyone within the county, regardless of their location, age, race, or economic status. As part of that commitment, our grant programs have grown steadily to include more artists as well as organizations with little to know in increased funding, thus making an already competitive process even more difficult. Arts Westchester has a program called Arts Alive, in which we distribute about $63,000 uh, to Westchester artists and art organizations 
through its application process. Every year we receive more requests than we can fund. For example, this year alone, the requests have tripled. The requests are largely coming from art projects, which happen in every legislative district in the, in the county. And what these programs do is enhance the community public art, after school pro programs, as well as art classes from kids from homeless areas. So what's our ask? We're asking you to support the grassroots arts in, in our communities with a $250,000 addition to the Arts Westchester Challenge matching program. And the beauty of the challenge program is that it's a public-private matching program that invests the communities in which you represent and which, in which the constituents that you serve. So with the additional funding, Arts Westchester can open up the challenge program to increase more of these grassroots groups and contribute to Westchester's overall cultural experience. Westchester County and Arts Westchester have a very unique opportunity to build and to support all of Westchester's communities through the arts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, next, um, Stan Sellers. Um, you, Stan, you want us to bring you the mic? Uh, I got him. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll be all right. Whoever made the comment about this hall no. uh, is absolutely correct. Anyway, I'll be all right. Uh, I'm Stan Selbst, and I'm on the board of the Family Service Society of Yonkers and the advisory committee of JCY Westchester Community Partners. Seth Berman, our executive director, and Sally Pinto, whom I will yield to in just a moment. Despite all of the very real issues described here this evening. My wife and I have lived here for 55 years, and it's a great place to live and raise a family. Thank you for your commitment to the service organization of Westchester County. Uh, we don't envy your task here uh, under the circumstances that we all understand. Uh, I'm here to urge you to continue to support and in some way, we'll be asking specifically for uh, an increase for our literacy programs, which helps so many people do what is necessary to get a job and survive in today's technical world. We're here to ask you to support our kinship program, which, in which children, in which grandparents take care of children because the children are in jail or on drugs or dead or God knows what. And without those programs, those children would be in the county uh, welfare programs. And, and we know that saves a lot of money. In our kinship program, you'll hear, uh, our guardianship program, you'll hear more about in a moment. I yield to Sally Pinto because she's in the field in the trenches every day. Yeah? Yeah, I'm fine. At least I think so. Okay. Hello, thank you. Um, and thank you for having this forum because hopefully that will also translate into putting um, a budget together that is helpful not only to our agency but to all the agencies that are represented here. Um, we serve the schools, children in schools all over Westchester County um, and we bring them mentoring programs, one-on-one -on -one mentoring or group mentoring during the day or after school. Um, we had uh, served last year 6,953 students, 649 adults, and 188 student mentors with a total of 26,988 literacy sessions. The Kinship Support Program, as Stan had just mentioned, serves over 100 families. So what does that mean? That means that we dedicate our time to the children which are the future of Westchester. Not only just in Yonkers, but in Mount Vernon, Ossining, you name it, we're there and we're always trying to expand. So we'd like that, that impact that you're helping us with, and we thank you for all the impact, all the funding that you've provided so far. We'd like for that to continue, but not only to continue, but to increase. We're looking at um, a Smart Investing Kids for, that was cut last year for 45,000, uh, kinship support caregivers uh, for the under age of 55 for 45,000, and for guardianship of $10,000. So um, again, children are our future, as I always say in many hats that I wear, but this hat tonight is JCY Westchester Community Partners, 
and the Family Service Society of Yonkers. So when children read at their reading level, it brings them confidence and success. When children succeed, our Westchester Council succeeds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. Hi, I'm Seth Berman, the Executive Director of Family Service Society of Yonkers. And again, I'd just like to extend my gratitude to the county for their continuing support of our programs. And as Stan said, we recognize the challenges that lie ahead, and we're most hopeful that the county will continue to be as supportive as they have in the past. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, up next, we have Dean Martin that will be followed by Ariel Boone. Good evening. I want to thank you, uh, Executive Latimer, Deputy. Uh, right, my name is Dean Martin. I live in Yonkers. And I'm a member of uh, also a committee under uh, Community Voices Heard called Homeless of People to Otherwise Known as Hacked. Uh, <clears throat> this committee made up of homeless people and formerly homeless people, which I am a formerly homeless person. And we seek to correct injustices and make things better. I myself was homeless <coughs> for 18 months and uh, I was a, res a resident in the Grass Science Homeless Shelter. HACT is putting together a report on homelessness in Westchester, and uh, we're, we're near completion, but it's not done, but uh, we'll get in there. We have some preliminary recommendations we want to share with you tonight. One is to expand the supply of shelter beds and make them easier for um, people to get into. We talked about this earlier, Dr. Jenkins. Um, we have somehow, since 2010, this county has lost over 200 residential and family shelter beds um, through attrition, through loss of programs, and so on. We, we need to replace them, definitely. The loss has led to severe, unacceptable problems. Last winter, a church had to open its doors and overnight overflow sites for families. One of our family shelters had run out of room. Residential shelters are for single adults. People turned away from them and had to sleep in drop-ins. Until recently, drop-ins closed early in the morning, forcing people to wander the streets. And they provide few services for help. This also brings me up another matter regarding the homeless. It's often hard for homeless people to get into residential shelters, pretty hard. Entry into a residential shelter requires a referral from the Department of Social Services. And in, two, in 2016, the county's Department of Community Mental Health took a survey with people staying in drop-in shelters. Most of them reported uh, being denied these services. They said the process was overwhelming and confusing. And I'm going to um, hand both those reports to you. The Department, uh, the Department of Social Services must create a clear, simple list of documents required to enter the residential shelter. It's so simple to do that, right? The, this list should be given to homeless people and posted on the county's website. Anyone who has these documents must be allowed to enter the shelter system. If all our residential shelter beds are full, the person should be put on a waiting list and called up as soon as one opens. One more thought. We are currently entering the, more, the worst time of the year for a homeless person. The weather is beginning to get colder, the days shorter, the nights longer. We have to make sure our homeless neighbors are receiving the help that they need. County Executive Latimer, as you consider the budget, I'm asking that you make these issues a high priority, okay? I've lived in Westchester all my life. When, when I became homeless, I didn't have to go to another county to get a bed. I got one here, and I, be, I found an apartment, I, I, I received report, but that's because I was able to advocate for myself. We need more support here, and we can give it to them. Thank you, Thank you. Ariel Gould, followed by Jurandy Martinez. I'm 
an attorney with Make the Road New York here in White Plains. Make the Road has over 20 years of experience in defending and empowering New York's immigrant and working class communities. We have 23,000 members across New York City, Westchester, and Long Island. This year we finalized a merger with the Westchester Hispanic Coalition, where it was before, to combine our service and become one organization. Together we have a fully <coughs> bilingual staff here in White Plains, and we have extensive experience providing culturally competent legal services to low income and immigrant Westchester residents. The legal services we provide are in family law, employment law, and immigration. In addition to providing culturally responsive services, Make the Roads Westchester office has recently launched a new organizing team. We conduct political education and nonpartisan civic engagement to build the leadership of immigrant and low-income Westchester residents to strategize and work for solutions to the intersecting issues that impact them. Because of the funding that we receive from the county, we are able to provide high quality representation and help our clients, in my case, immigration clients, navigate the complex issues and put them on a path to green cards and accomplishing their dreams here in Westchester. As I said, I am an immigration attorney, so I thought it would be helpful to share a little bit about what this funding and support does for my clients. I have two examples that come to mind. One is a young woman, she's about 17 years old. She's in 11th grade now here in Westchester. She's gone to kindergarten here, she's gone to elementary school here, high school here. I'm helping her and recently had a chance to look at her report card. I think the lowest grade that I saw was an A. She's, more, she's from Guatemala originally, but she's more comfortable speaking in English than she's in Spanish. But she's had a deportation order since she was four years old. So I am working with her in family court and immigration court trying to help her to make it so that she can obtain her dreams. The other client I have in mind is a more recent arrival. She came here just within the past two or three years. She is also from Central America originally, from the Northern Triangle. She fled requesting asylum after her husband was killed. She made a life here, began to work here. She met a new husband here, someone who she thought she could build a life with. The relationship became abusive. He was physically violent toward her. She rented a room in an apartment with other individuals, he wouldn't even let her leave the room if she was not there. When he tried to threaten her with a gun, she called the police and she got out. Right now we're working with her to try to get her status so she can have stability and mental health services here that she so drastically needs because she can't go back. The families that we serve at Make the Road New York are among the lowest income, most exploited, and less able to access services here. They're particularly susceptible to wage theft, workplace discrimination, and sexual violence. Many are lim limited English proficient, and eligibility rules often exclude them from accessing low-level English, low, uh, sorry, low in, low-cost legal services, which is what we are trying to help. So, along with our partners in the Westchester Women's Agenda, we respectfully request a five percent increase to our funding from Westchester County in the fiscal year 2019 budget. Thank you so much for your time and for your support. Thank you, Jerandy Martinez. Good evening and thank you so much for this public hearing. As you know, our immigrant community members are under attack. Every day brings new information about confrontations, abuses, and deportations, not to mention the separation of families and children from their parents. Our community lives in fear of law enforcement, of going to court, being detained by immigration agents. Policies are forcing undocumented immigrants who suffer domestic violence and domestic abuse to decide which is riskier staying with their abusers, or going to court and possibly being detained by immigration agents. At CRC, we see day in and day out the palpable fear by families in the county. Our understanding of the complexities of their lives and the trust they place in us make us first in line when they seek assistance. Now more than ever, we represent a safe haven for our Latino families. Additionally, we continue to provide services and opportunities to thrive for workforce development through our Building Our Future initiative which provides economic opportunities for job readiness and language access. We stand committed as we know you are. We thank you for the Immigrant Protection Act, but we know that our families are still vulnerable. So in this climate and in responding to the community needs, we stand with Westchester Women's Agenda for their 5% increase. But we also know that we would like to be on the budget because we're providing services for domestic violence in light of um, the merger with Make the Road, I mean, their, their thing is organizing, so they, they dissolved the domestic violence program, which means that we're receiving an influx of those clients 
and we have to respond to those community needs. Additionally, we are also providing our Building Our Future program. It's the strongest program we have, and we are providing opportunities for economic development that's then going to help the community and Westchester County thrive. So we appreciate and support our partners in, in the work that we're doing, but we're also asking for $150,000 in the budget for the services that we're providing at Community Resource Center every single day. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leslie Gordon, and she will be followed by Jake Furry. Good evening, County Executive Ladner, Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins, and Director of Operations Joan McDonald, electeds and Westchester County residents. I have the honor of being the President and CEO of Feeding Westchester, formerly known as the Food Bank for Westchester. I'm a lifetime and fourth generation Westchester County resident, happily so, and I've been doing work in the hunger and food insecurity space for more than a decade. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the reality of hunger in our county community and the need for your continued support to ensure that residents have access to nutritious food to feed themselves and their families. We'd be grateful if you'd consider a, an increase of 5% or more. That's about 80,000 meals. The impact of your dollar goes far at Feeding Westchester. At minimum, we appreciate preservation of the current contract. I don't have to tell you that hunger impacts every race, age, religion, ethnicity. Here in Westchester County, one in five residents, nearly 200,000 of our neighbors, or 20% of our resident base, don't always know when their next meal is coming from or what it will be. In some communities, it nears 25% of the population base. At Feeding Westchester, we work to get nourishing food to residents. That's fresh produce, meat, poultry, dairy, whole grains, and so much more. Westchester County, as you know, is often characterized by its high standard of living and seemingly widespread affluence. Unfortunately, this often overshadows neighbors in need in every community in Westchester. We're talking about Kisco, Yorktown, Peekskill, Montrose, Ossining, my hometown, New Rochelle, Larchmont, Mamaroneck, White Plains, Port Chester, and so much more. Without food, what happens? We see high crime because people are what's called hangry. We see increased disease, high rates of absenteeism at work, poor school performance for kids, delayed childhood development. Food insecurity costs all of us. And with the potential looming federal cuts to the Farm Bill on SNAP, formerly called Food Stamps, WIC, we're likely to see more of our neighbors struggle and look to us for services. This year we're on pace to distribute about 10 million pounds of food or half of what's needed in this county. We need your continued partnership to make this happen and incrementally grow the amount of food we send into communities. We do our work in partnership with other organizations. We're constantly focused on efficiency. Every dollar helps us distribute four meals. We're at the heart of a network of about 300 member agencies and partners in the county who help us get food directly into the hands of people. Increasingly, our food is done through strategic alliances with other high-performing nonprofit organizations to help connect residents not only with food but other resources to stabilize their lives including Open Door Family Medical Center, Ark of Westchester, Yonkers Police Athletic League, the County Jail, and more. In addition to food, we provide hands-on cooking and nutrition education classes free of charge. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Leslie. Next speaker is Jake Furry, and will be followed by Manku Capasso, if I must pronounce that, I apologize. Correct me when you come to the microphone. First, Jake Furr. Good afternoon. My name is Jake. I'm from the Westchester Youth Council. And we're here to uh, thank you for the funding that you've provided to us and ask you to keep supporting us, uh, but also to reiterate the fact that youth are the future and that a little bit more funding towards youth now uh, will help ensure that Westchester uh, has the greatest uh, greatest future that it can have and stay a great county. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. All right, but you Good just had day. trouble meeting him, so. I've got to work on my handwriting. My name is Mary K. Paso. Okay. I'm here on behalf of the Westchester Public Private Partnership, 
I work with the Department of Senior Programs and Services, coordinating the chronic disease and chronic pain self-management programs. These evidence-based programs are proven to, to save per person $714 per year for anybody who participates in these workshops. They're nationally recognized, they re result in reduced emergency room visits and reduced hospitalization. They also provide an opportunity, very important for older adults, to be able to socialize and to make new friends. We offer these workshops free of charge throughout the county, particularly focusing on frail, vulnerable, low-income populations. As a resident and a property owner in Westchester County, I certainly recognize the challenge that lies ahead for the budget. I respectfully request that funding for this program, as well as the other innovative programs under livable communities, like TIPS, the Telehealth Intervention Program for Seniors, continue. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mary Kay. Um, up next, we have Giordano Lorenzo, who will be followed by his Martha Carvalho um, et al. in the group. So, Giordano Lorenzo. Okay. Going once, going twice. Giordana Lorenzo, if you're here, please identify yourself and your turn has come to speak. I will put it at the back of the list in case you just have a good time her. Gotcha. And up next we have Martha Cavallo, um, Maria Lazama, Maria Rosario, and Janet Roland. We have uh, three clients from the Community Resource Center who uh, are going to speak to you. And the person who's going to represent them is Maria Osorio, who is a survivor of domestic violence. And I will be translating. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Maria Osorio y vivo en la Villa de Mamarone. Good evening. My name is Maria Osorio and I live in the village of Mamarone. Soy una sobreviviente de violencia doméstica. I am a survivor of domestic violence. Cuando me sentí en desesperación y no saber a dónde ir con mis tres hijos, recurrí al Community Resource Center. When I felt in desperation and I didn't know where to go with my three children, I went to the Community Resource Center. En el centro encontré personas que me ayudaron a conseguir ayuda para violencia doméstica. At the center, I found uh, people who helped me uh, with uh, assistance for domestic violence. Gracias al centro, pude conseguir consejería, ayuda para llenar documentación y ayuda legal. Thanks to the center, I was able to get counseling, um, assistance to fill out documentation, and legal assistance. Gracias al centro, pude encontrar esperanza para continuar con mi vida junto a mis hijos asistiendo a grupos de apoyo para mujeres. Thanks to the center, I was able to find hope and continue my life with my children. I assisted to support growth for women, uh, uh, survivors of domestic violence. Pude aprender cómo formar relaciones saludables y cómo dar a mis hijos un ambiente saludable. I was able, I was able to learn how to form <coughs> healthy relationships and how to raise my children in a healthy environment. Sin estos servicios no hubiera podido sobrevivir. Les pido que continúen apoyando al centro con fondos para que estos programas continúen. Without these services, I wasn't able to survive, and I request you to continue supporting this the center with funds to continue providing these services for women of domestic violence. Y mujeres como yo puedan tener oportunidad de vivir una vida segura y sin violencia. And women like me are able to have a life, a safe, a safe life and without violence. Thank you. Okay. All right. 
Thank you. Up next, we have Allegra Dengla, who will be followed by Bob Levy. And just a quick reminder, if you have not signed um, to speak, then you will have the opportunity, if you can just go and speak to um, our folks at the back table to get a sign-up card to be able to speak. Thank you. Allegra. Yeah, hi. Allegra Dengler, uh, Citizens for Voting Integrity New York. Um, it's been in the news a lot, but uh, over a year ago uh, in the Senate, um, Senator King from, uh, from Maine, talking about our elections and our vote counting, he said, everybody says cyber is going to be the next Pearl Harbor. This is the largest wind-up to a punch in world history, and we're not fully prepared. That was in the Senate. That was in Washington. They didn't, they punted. They didn't do anything to protect our elections. Uh, New York City, there was some effort to get a right to a recount so that we can look at those paper ballots. Again, nothing happened. And here, and this is where the rubber meets the road because the county is uh, on the front lines. <laughs> It's on the battleship Arizona in this Pearl Harbor, right at the center of where votes are counted. Um, as you're looking ahead to next year's budget, it's too late to, it's not too late to do things. Uh, you know, I think you all have a, a list. Uh, the uh, Brennan Center had a, has a great list of ways to be prepared for a uh, cyber attack and to protect the election, election security advanced planning checklist. There are some things that need to be funded um, going forward, uh, but also, if you've got a little extra money in this year's budget, adequate ballots, uh, you know, enough ballots in case the lights go out. The Russians have the capability to disrupt the electrical grid. Um, Chinese have put chips on electronic equipment nationwide that was, that's very hard to detect. The voting machine companies themselves, the three major for-profit private corporations, the New York Times article singled them out that they are blocking uh, efforts to improve their cybersecurity, and they're 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 vulnerable themselves. So we have, um, you know, the New York Times article: as midterms approach, America's electronic voting systems are more vulnerable than ever. Why isn't anyone trying to fix them? <laughs> so this these are two things: security improvements in the in the warehouse, I think you're aware of that. You know, the fact that we've got, you know, these ballots are like, um, you know, they're like uh, dollar bills. A bank wouldn't leave uh, their vaults unsecured without alarm system and without, um, without uh, security cameras. Um, and just g going forward, uh, the money that we get from the state or the mandates that we get from the state should have to do with counting the paper ballots and make sure that they accurate, they're accurate. Uh, and uh, early voting may be a good idea, but it would be another unfunded mandate coming down to the county board of elections to provide, you know, funding for these for the extra weeks, of, and uh, they, that should be delayed until there's adequate funding to hand count paper ballots to make sure the vote was right. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next speaker is Bob Levy. We have no other cards after Mr. Levy, so if someone wishes to be heard, we'd ask you to go uh, make sure you log in uh, and uh, at the front, and we'll take you after Mr. Levy, and uh, we'll make that request after he speaks, and uh, if we don't have a speaker after him, we'll take a 10-minute uh, break. Mr. Levy. Uh, thank you, County Executive. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to the voices of your constituents tonight. Uh, I'd like to speak about the repaving project of runway 1634 at uh, HPN. And what I'd like to do is save the county some money this year. Uh, right now, the runway has a quote unquote good rating by the FAA. This rating is the second highest they issue and the same rating as all JFK and LaGuardia runways. There's no immediate need for the repavement. The project will only invite larger aircraft to HBN. The current level of aircraft noise, air, and water pollution will only worsen with the larger aircraft. What we'd like to see done is hold off another year while the county gets a better handle on the future vision of HPN. The runway pavement might be a step we take today that we can't take back tomorrow. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. The next speaker is Myra Saul. Hi, my name is Myra Saul. I'm one of the organizers of Westchester for Change, a volunteer organization that advocates and educates for progressive policies in the county. I want to thank County Executive George Latimer and his administration for holding this hearing and for holding a series of public hearings about the county airport last summer. This is vast improvement over the last administration, which only paid lip service to public input and often acted in private. At the airport hearings, the public expressed concern about the environmental impacts created by the airport and was highly critical of the noise pollution emanating from the airport. To its credit, the county has started a cleanup of certain pollutants at the airport and restarted critical environmental monitoring at the airport, which was discontinued under the prior administration. The county is now in the midst of securing a firm to oversee, in essence, a new master plan for the airport, which will undergo public review. The county budget contains an amount and sum of many millions of dollars to repay the main runway at the airport in the name of safety and routine maintenance. This is putting the cart before the horse. The airport is a complex organism. Private and commercial travel, hangars, parking garages, lounges, gates, eating facilities, the surrounding communities, and importantly, its location adjacent to the Kensico Reservoir, a source of drinking water for 9 million people. As a matter of course, then, a change to one aspect of this dynamic organism will affect others. A good analogy is to a hotel. Some people come in large groups to an employer or convention, others individually. There may be condos or timeshares within the financial structure of the hotel. There may be many or few rooms. Are there ballrooms, garages, restaurants? There are building and commercial codes to consider. Should there be an upgrade or a renovation? When? If so, what should be the design and ambience? The point here is that even before these decisions can be made, there needs to be a vision to fit the various options into a whole. What type of hotel is this? A boutique? A large commercial hotel in the city center? Luxury? Mid-market? You get the idea. We don't have a vision in the master plan yet for the airport, and until we do, we won't have an idea how, how one change affects another, especially with respect to the environment. And that one change may tie the hands of future planners for many, many years. First, we need a new master plan with public input with careful consideration of the environment. For critics will say, we need to repave the airport in the name of safety now. Now, no one wants to an unsafe airport. However, one of the FAA's objectives is to promote safety in airport operations. So the concept will be used in any discussion with respect to any airport. Safety is a conclusion. It is not a substitute for discussion of the facts and making an analysis leading to a label of safe or unsafe. My understanding is that both LaGuardia and Kennedy have the same rating for their runways as the airports in our LaGuardia and Kennedy unsafe. To ask the question is to know the answer. Do we need to repave the runway now on the basis of routine maintenance? If it is in good repair now, why be slavish to some schedule which obviously doesn't fit the facts? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, we have no cards. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard at any topic? Okay. So we're going to take a uh, it's about quarter after now. We'll take about a 10 minute break. Uh, for those who wish to stay, uh, we will be here until 9 o'clock to accommodate anybody who might come before the scheduled uh, end time of this at 9. Uh, but uh, for the next 10 minutes, we'll take a break. Obviously, you're welcome to stay and uh, you're obviously able to go at any point in time. So thank you for being with us, and we'll uh, continue this in about 10 minutes.